All right, I think we're about ready to get going. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for your interest in the Ontario Justice Education Network and our programs, and thank you especially for rising to the challenge of doing justice education programming with vulnerable youth. Um, obviously, all of our volunteers bring a really uh, incredible wealth of knowledge and experience to our programs, but our hope is that whether you are uh, experienced in doing this kind of work or in working with community or whether it's your first time, there will be something in this guide that's useful to you that's either new or helpful along the way. We're going to proceed by just kind of walking through uh, all the different stages of being involved with the program and give some tips for things to think about in each case. Uh, so we'll take you through the whole thing. First up is about knowing your program. So OGEN programs are going to be a little bit different from other presentations or workshops you've probably done before, uh, even public facing ones. The biggest single difference is that uh, your program will not just be about giving legal information. This is a really common thing in public legal education programs uh, and in other ones you may have participated in. Justice education is a little bit different and the thing that makes it different is that we focus on increasing young people's legal capability. So legal capability is the measure of how much a person is actually able to do practically, concretely, to get good outcomes to legal issues. Um, in, in simpler terms, that means, do they have access to the information, the resources, and the skills that they need to navigate the law? That includes managing legal risk, even before they're in a, case, a situation where they have uh, a legal problem. Obviously, it involves responding to legal issues that arise in the course of their lives, as they will for almost all of us. And it also includes uh, the higher level of participating in civic processes that affect the law, uh, understanding what the law means uh, on a social level, um, being able to uh, critique it and, and uh, write to your MP and all that kind of good stuff. So our programs are designed to work on building all levels of legal capability, uh, and they're based on evidence-based practices. The advantage that you have in this context of, of coming to us as a volunteer is that some helpful OGEN program manager has already done all that work for you. Uh, if you've received uh, agendas or program plans or anything, that means somebody with a lot of experience in this area who's really knowledgeable has sat down and built out a program that is designed to get the best outcomes for you and also for the audience. Uh, they're designed to support young people in learning and, and building and growing their, their skills, being introduced to new resources, sources of practical help, um, but they're also there to set you up for success. They're there to help you do the best possible job of connecting with the youth in the short time that you have in making yourself understood in in providing information in a way that makes it the most usable that it can be. There are a couple of reasons why we don't just provide legal information in our sessions. One of them is that uh, people actually don't remember detailed information very well, almost no matter how good or knowledgeable the teacher is. Uh, we don't always know whether someone will still remember the facts correctly when they leave session or a day later or um, a couple of years later when an issue actually comes up for them. The second reason is that the law changes, right? Um, so we don't want people uh, correctly remembering information that is now out of date two or three years later and repeating it. The third reason is that uh, people also misremember things, which, which can be bad. It's sort of in the same category as the law changing, where we don't want to be in a situation where someone doesn't go look up what the, what the rules are now around something because they think they know it, because they think they remember. Um, and that's extremely, extremely common. So rather than having uh, an expert at the front of the room who sort of follows a PowerPoint and monologues through all the good stuff that they know about their area of expertise, because they are an expert, we are trying to introduce resources uh, both for sources of understandable legal information that are trustworthy and reliable and we know will be up to date, and also uh, concrete resources about places they can go for help, places they can send other people to get questions answered, uh, and to sort of be warmly brought into the legal system. So if you have an agenda or a program plan that's been sent to you by people who are involved in planning the program, uh, whether that's OGEN staff or volunteers, take a look at it before you go. And the biggest thing to look at, apart from the plan timings and the activities, is to know the objectives for each session. It's likely that uh, 
the session that you're participating in is part of a larger whole. It's very rare for us to do one-off uh, sessions where we just go into a community one time, sort of dump a whole bunch of information on them and get out. We try to work much more uh, collaboratively, which means that we're going into the community multiple times. We're meeting the same youth multiple times, ideally with the same uh, volunteers and sets of presenters, but not necessarily. So it's important to take a minute and make sure you understand how the part that you're going to be there for fits into the larger whole. Objectives also will be helpful to you because they'll help you make quick decisions on your feet. Uh, it's very rare that programs unfold uh, tidily along the lines that they are planned. Uh, young people often have questions about the law, which means you're going to have some tangents. You're going to be pulled in some different directions. And knowing the objectives of your session is going to help you make educated decisions on the spot about whether we chase those tangents down the rabbit hole because they're productive and they're important or whether we want to keep things moving in a certain direction. And remember, if any of this doesn't make sense to you, you do have contact with OGEN staff and volunteers. You can ask. They'll be delighted to explain any of this. So the next big thing to think about is who is your audience? Uh, and especially in working with vulnerable youth, this is an important thing to pause and explore before you get in the room. So a couple of questions you want to ask yourself. What do I know about this audience? Uh, and when you're thinking about this, it's important to interrogate yourself a little bit about, do I actually know this? Have I absorbed this from somewhere? Am I operating on the basis of generalizations or maybe stereotypes that are coming into this? Um, audiences are, are going to be very, very different. Uh, a First Nations audience might be very different from... Uh, a group of mature students at the college level versus a group of young moms. Of course, there may be students who fall into all of those categories and all those, those things will intersect and be true and complicate each other in particular ways. But you always want to find out either from uh, the OGEN representative that you're working with or from the host of the program themselves what you should expect from this particular group. Uh, and obviously, because we're talking about law and legal issues, we want to know a little bit about this community's relationship with the legal system. Do we know if there have been recent incidents that we should be aware of? What kind of legal issues are coming up regularly in this community? Uh, what are these young people likely to have seen in their personal lives or to have seen family members or friends go through that's going to shade the way we should approach this? Do I know what kinds of questions they might have? Uh, and this is a, a good opportunity to ask the facilitator or the host, um, because both of those people are likely to have done a fair bit of thinking about what's going to be of interest to this particular audience. And partially they'll have built this program to address those questions, but it's still good to know um, what, what tends to be interesting to young people uh, from this community about the topic that we're going to be discussing. Uh, it's important to ask in advance whether you have a captive audience or if you're going into more of a drop-in program. It can change a whole lot about how your program plays out, whether uh, students are electing to be there, are they free to get up and leave whenever they want, are they uh, getting up and managing other things, coming in and out, or do you have a pretty set group that's going to have butts in seats for the duration of your time? That's going to change how you engage them, that's going to change what you expect in terms of the continuity of who's going to be there from session to session and uh, a fair bit about how you conduct yourself. It's worth asking the hosts uh, what the norms of this space are. Some places are uh, much more lax about things that can be surprising to volunteers, including things like being on your phones or bringing food in and out or you know, do we always start with a, a group norms exercise? Uh, it's good to ask explicitly about this stuff before you come in. Uh, in general, when you're presenting to an audience, it's good to think of yourself as a guest in their space. Uh, maybe that's obvious to a lot of people, but for the most part, we want to be matching ourselves and our tone and our behavior to what's normal and acceptable uh, and respectful in the space we're entering. What experience does this audience have with the legal issues we are addressing? Where are they likely to be starting from? Sometimes, you know, if you go into, for example, a program for young parents who are living in a facility for young parents, um, they may already be pretty knowledgeable about some basic family law systems, about uh, 
child services involvements about uh, some basic processes of the court and child support and, and those kinds of things. You may have an audience with much more experiential knowledge than in other in other contexts. And it's really good to know what exactly that might look like. What What's that profile? Um, because it'll obviously shape both where you start explaining the law and also how you pitch it. And you want to know what stereotypes or preconceptions they're likely to have about you based on your profession and your self-presentation. This is just a realistic part of being a presenter or a facilitator. Um, young people are looking at us and assessing us in the same way that we're sizing them up when we go into a space. Um, if you haven't looked at any research lately on uh, the public's perception of the legal profession, we could strongly recommend looking at the recent uh, report from the Action Group on Access to Justice at the Law Society of Ontario. They have published uh, a really fascinating uh, cross-section uh, quantitative survey about what people associate with lawyers, judges, uh, legal types, um, and it's it's very illuminating in terms of understanding what the baggage is that, uh, whether you want to or not, you're bringing into the room with you. Uh, the easiest way to combat a bunch of those is to be sincere and be genuine when you go in and, you know, not not go out of your way trying to fight them, but just uh, seem like a, a person who's there to speak honestly. So it's important to note that um, the way Ojen talks about law may be a little different than you're used to as well. Um, the place that we always start from is this question that we want to highlight from the last slide, which is, what experience does this audience have with the legal issues we are addressing? Where are they likely to be starting from? So when you're going into program, uh, it's important to remember that everyone enters the room with some information, and that information may be better or worse. It may be a really complicated mix of the two. Uh, the core thing that Ojen always wants to focus on when we're talking to young people about the law is being really upfront and acknowledging that there's often a difference between the law on the books and the law the way it plays out on the street. In practice, all kinds of things happen, and we know that, and there's nothing to be gained by not being upfront about that. So as much as we want to talk about the sort of the rules element of law and what the rules are and how it all works. We also want to remember that the more valuable information and the more important information and the information by which the public actually judges and uses the legal system is how the law works in practice. Related to that, it's a good idea to be ready, whatever your topic is, to talk about the why of it. The public, much more sometimes than legal professionals, really is invested in a, a fairness-based interpretation of the law. Young people especially are very willing to question things that don't make sense to them. Uh, and so you are going to get questions about why. Why is it like that? Why is that the rule? Who does that help? What's that about? And the, the answer for that won't be satisfying if it's just, well, that's what the legislation says. We always want to be able to explain the policy reasons as much as we can behind certain choices. We don't have an obligation to apologize for those or pretend that they are necessarily universally just or that everyone should accept them without question, but we should understand and be able to talk about, for whatever argument can be made for those provisions, why those things came to be. What's the thought behind them? That's really the hook of what most people are interested in about law, and that's how they'll assess it. At the same time, if you're going into a, a community of vulnerable youth, it's likely that at least some people in the room will have had some kind of experience with this area of law before. Those are likely to come out during program. People on the whole tend to be pretty eager to talk about their legal experiences, especially with someone who has a little bit of knowledge about this. Of course, that varies based on audience. Some you'll find are much more forthcoming than others, but it's something to be prepared for. And this can be a little bit tricky. Uh, we'll get into this in a little more in depth later, but you may hear stories repeated back to you of things not working at all the way they're supposed to, things that don't really make sense to you or you think might be wrong. A really fundamental principle of engaging, especially with marginalized youth, is that you have to respect their experiences. Whatever they took from that experience, 
they weren't wrong about their own their own history and their own takeaways and their their own experience in that context so we can talk about places where people are have misinformation about the black letter law or about how things are supposed to work but we're not here to correct people's understanding of what happened to them related to that communities do share knowledge with each other about the law um partially this sometimes is in the form of almost like urban legends or urban myths about what the rules are. A really popular one when I was growing up was that um, if you got caught driving without your a copy of your driver's license, you actually could go turn it in at the police station within like two or three days and not get a ticket. That's not really a rule anywhere, but if you had asked anyone in my high school, they would have sworn that that was the case. This kind of thing proliferates wherever people are interacting with, with the law. It spreads really easily, and as much as it's frustrating, it's worth remembering that it's actually pretty hard to access really good, solid information about the law. And, you know, people rely on their friends and partners and families' word on lots of things, and this is just one of those things. Law is only one part of life for most people. Um, most people have other priorities and, and other things to focus on. So we want to always be trying to explain the law clearly. We're not trying to persuade anyone of the moral or ethical value of anything. We're open to disagreement. We're open to people, you know, having positive experiences and thinking that things are good. Uh, but we're here strictly in an education context. We're here to, to be clear about everything we can be clear about, about how the law works and what the rules are. So we talked earlier about objectives and how each session in each program is going to have objectives. Um, these will vary depending on what you're exactly going to be talking about, but it's a pretty safe bet that most programs are going to include a couple things. They're going to include some basic legal information, usually about a pretty practical area of law that people are likely to encounter. It's going to talk about how to spot a legal issue. Now, this in particular is important to not skip over um, because it's extremely common, especially with uh, marginalized youth, that they actually will end up being important sources of information for their whole communities. Um, a good example of this is uh, in a lot of newcomer communities, the young people may have the most facility with English or French. We found it's actually extremely common for young people in those families to end up serving as interpreters or navigators for their family when they're having issues with the doctor, the government, with the legal system. Uh, and so we always, 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 as part of building legal capability, don't just want to be giving them the information. We want to be helping them figure out when you have a legal issue. We want to be introducing them to sources of reliable legal support that are based in their community. Um, before you go, you're going to want to get the contact information for the closest community legal clinic. You might want to look up some other uh, places that you're going to refer them to, including uh, public legal information websites. We recommend stepstojustice.ca uh, by our partner organization, Community Legal Education Ontario, for just about everything that they have up, because it's a really excellent site. But there may be other places where you know for people to get legal support that will be uh, equally helpful or more so. Each program's pretty much guaranteed to include at least one, usually multiple, experiential learning activities where students are going to have the opportunity to apply their knowledge and skills. This is the single biggest way to try to get information and skills to stick. And it's also an opportunity for them to show leadership and for you to show uh, that you're impressed and supportive of them. Um, Ultimately, we want to support the audience in uh, giving help and information to other people in their communities. So keep that frame in mind uh, as you're going through your program, no matter what it contains. Next, before you go, getting ready to go to program. Um, first, you want to review the plan and its objectives. Uh, a great idea is to fill out a daily program notes sheet. You can find that template attached to the page where you're watching this presentation, but we've actually made this worksheet that will uh, help you write down all the key stuff that you're going to need for your presentation. Um, that includes right at the top the three main objectives for this particular session. That includes contact information for services that you're going to discuss. Um, and it includes some space for you to make notes about what parts of the agenda are your responsibility and to write down any things you need to be able to refer to quickly. 
Um, it's a good idea, as we said, to try to anticipate questions, to look up what's been in the news lately. If there's been something uh, being covered in the media related to this topic, you're going to get questions about it almost certainly. And the last thing, this is easy to skip, but please consider doing it, is to actually practice. So you can practice a couple things. Um, even if you are a pretty experienced presenter uh, and pretty experienced in your area of expertise, you may not have had to explain it in depth to 16-year-olds before. Uh, luckily, this is something that you actually 100% can practice and work out the kinks of how am I going to word this particular thing so that it's clear and understandable. Um, often when Oden staff who are pretty experienced at this stuff uh, are going into program, will on the way there, uh, you know, on the on public transit or in the car, start playing around with wording in our heads for how we're going to introduce key provisions or give clear instructions for certain uh, transitions or activities. These are things that are really easy to think that you know and then not do well when it comes to it, especially with instructions. Um, you may not be the one who has to introduce activities if you're not the facilitator, but either way it can be helpful to practice um, how you'll manage changes in subject matter, how you'll segue from one thing to the other, and how you'll explain really complicated ideas. So next, when you get to program who's in the room, um, we have a, a clear division of roles in most OGEN programs. Yours may work a little different, but these are basically the four categories of people that you're likely to see in the room. So first we have the hosts. Um, OGEN doesn't do any freestanding programming, really, where we are just in, trying to get individual young people to come to us, to our programs. We're always working in partnership with uh, youth serving community agencies or schools, working with the young people they already have a, have a relationship with. So the people who typically run the space are going to be there in the room, at least to some extent. Your hosts are responsible for the space. They have a longstanding relationship with the audience and they're an invaluable source of information. Um, you will probably want to go a few minutes early and chat up the hosts a little bit about um, you know, what's the personality of this group like? What should you expect? Are you going to start on time? Should you hold for 15 minutes while latecomers trickle in? All that kind of stuff. They, they are a huge ally for you in serving your audience well. The next category is facilitators. Often these will be OGEN staff or volunteers, depending on what kind of program you're involved with. But their main responsibility is for managing the flow of the program for having control of all the objectives and making sure that you're meeting them and for creating a comfortable space for both audience and presenters. The next category is, <laughs> this is probably you, the experts. Um, you're responsible for bringing your own knowledge about law, the legal system, or other issues. Uh, and you want to obviously be there to answer questions and present that information as well as you can. Uh, of course, we also want to pause to acknowledge that hosts, facilitators, and the audience have expertise too. They're in the room because they know about certain things and want to learn certain things as well. And finally, we have the audience. Uh, they were brought together for a reason, and their only job in this space is to participate in a way that is comfortable and productive for them. Uh, we, all three of the other categories, are working to make that comfortable and productive space as expansive as possible. Uh, and obviously our programs are all for their benefit. Okay, so next let's talk about working on your feet when you're in program. Um, we have a couple of tips that we want to lay out, especially for working with marginalized youth. First of all, be prepared to follow the lead of your facilitator or host. If you're in the room as an expert, the good news is you're not solely responsible for the flow of things. You have someone there to introduce you, to help with transitions, to help with instructions. Um, and that person really does know the most about what needs to happen in this session. So if they are interjecting or redirecting things or asking you to clarify, please be willing to work with them um, because they are probably the most knowledgeable person in the room about how the program needs to go. We want to always match the norms of the space, which we know both by watching students and by talking to the hosts ahead of time. We want to allow tangents when they're productive. Uh, sometimes 
young people will have really good questions uh, based on events in their own lives or in the community. And sometimes it'll be worth it to take a few minutes to actually follow that through, including sometimes if it seems like you just aren't going to be able to get on with the program until you've answered that one thing. At the same time, though, you do want to re direct conversations if they're becoming unproductive, if they're becoming hostile, or if they're just getting too far away from what we're trying to accomplish with the program. There's nothing wrong with changing direction if something isn't working. That includes activities. Every once in a while, despite everyone's best effort, we schedule something into a program that just doesn't work when we get down to it. There's nothing wrong with using your discretion to pivot when that happens if you have a better idea. Go ahead and reiterate instructions. Um, you, in most cases, uh, regardless of language levels in the room, will have to give instructions for activities a couple of times. Repeating them is completely normal, not patronizing. Go ahead and give it to them a couple times. If you have a relatively complicated thing, it's a good idea to give numbers to steps. So you can say and also sort of count out on your hand. Step number one, first, you're gonna do X, Y, Z. Second, take XYZ and do ABC. Third, we're going to do DEF. Um, that'll help remembering that there are three steps and here are the three things. Remember to continually scan for understanding. Uh, when you get going as a presenter, it's really easy to get in your own flow and in your own head and just sort of keep cranking along with the things that you want to get to. Uh, and it's easy to ignore what's going on in the audience. Make sure that you're continually looking around, actually looking at the young people to see if they're still with you on the ride. Um, if you're seeing confused faces, if you're seeing people disconnecting, you might have to backtrack a little bit and take another run at things. It's always a good idea and it's always okay to admit what you don't know or aren't sure about. Um, this is useful, especially if you're a law student or in any kind of learning position. Um, it's good to be honest about this stuff. Uh, it's not on you to know everything about every section of law. And it can be useful learning for people to see that you say, oh yeah, actually I don't know about that. That's a really complicated area. And if you have a second, you can demonstrate how to look up information about that. If you have a sense of what website might have some information, you can actually say, oh, here, let's let's check steps to justice. Let's check this nonprofit that does work in this area's website. Let's see if we can find that, because that way you're also introducing resources and you're modeling curiosity and you're creating a welcoming space. Um, don't assume anything about literacy in the groups that you're going into. Uh, this isn't just an issue with marginalized youth, although for various reasons it tends to manifest itself even more in marginalized communities, but uh, it's a good idea to read through materials with your students. Don't hand out oh, a long worksheet with a whole bunch of text and just say, we'll take it up in 20 minutes. Um, it's extremely common even in the adult population to actually have much lower literacy rates than you would think. I think uh, Cleo found recently that over half of adults in Canada um, lack the necessary literary skills to uh, read documents and accomplish everyday tasks. Um, so we always want to read through materials. We don't want anyone left behind simply because their reading levels aren't uh, where we thought they would be. Show curiosity. We talked about that. Always model an interest in what is going on around you. And a good rule of thumb in all things is when in doubt, be honest. So we're going to talk about a couple of tricky elements uh, that are likely to arise and things that, you know, take a little more thought beforehand. So we've talked a bit about wanting to explain things clearly in an approachable language. Um, that can sometimes be really tricky to do without talking down. Um, it's really easy to sort of turn that into sounding like you're talking to uh, primary school students uh, when we're when we're trying to say things simply and clearly. Um, plain language doesn't mean uh, not allowing room for complexity. It doesn't mean dumbing things down. It means being aware of how you're talking and how it's being received 
and attending to that constantly. So do be careful that you're both explaining things clearly and being friendly and approachable, but also not sort of being off-puttingly <laughs> condescending. Um, teens in particular have a, a, a razor-thin tolerance for being talked down to, so that's a quick way to turn off your audience. We also want to be aware of power differentials in the room. To some extent, just by virtue of you being a presenter, or if you're a lawyer, any sort of professional, or even just you being an adult who's probably older than your your students, there is a power differential in the room. Um, that's not even starting to take into account things like gender, race, education, class, um, status in Canada, all those different kinds of things. Um, so one of the most common ways that this manifests is that some lawyers uh, are really used to sort of a direct way of speaking, um, correcting people pretty directly, uh, answering yes or no questions um, pretty curtly. Uh, and it's important to be aware that a lot of those things in your tone that are perfectly professional and acceptable over the course of your private practice or whatever, especially if it's your litigation practice, um, may come off as really sort of brusque and uh, off-putting to young people based on your position and their position. So as much as we want to not talk down, we also want to be welcoming. We want to be aware of how um, we're sounding to them. We want to be genuine when we're showing interest in what they have to say or what they're curious about. We also want to be honest about the challenges in the justice system. Uh, we said before that you are not here to persuade anyone of anything, and that's definitely true. Um, it's okay to talk about the fact that there are access to justice challenges, that there are unsettled areas of law. Even lots of judges disagree about things. I mean, I always talk about um, in a Supreme Court case, there's plenty of, of instances where the highest court in the land with some of the best jurists, you know, four out of nine of them disagree sometimes with the decision that's made. Um, even experts have different opinions and different takes on things. Uh, and so it's okay to be, to be upfront about those kinds of, those kinds of difficulties. We want to talk a little more in depth about correcting misinformation. Um, this is a thing that will come up. Um, there's sort of a formula that lots of us use when doing this to make sure that we're not shutting people down but also that we're not letting misinformation flourish or, or be transmitted any further. The first thing is to validate that this was not a stupid thing to think. Um, you can use the frame that, oh yeah, actually lots of people think that's true, but um, just to give the sense that this is, this is common. Um, that's almost always true, by the way. It's very rare that only one person is thinking the, uh, the incorrect thing that gets said. Then after that validation, you want to give the correct information without repeating or emphasizing the incorrect part. There's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that if someone is in the audience only paying half attention, it's actually easy for them to just hear you <laughs> repeating the incorrect part, saying like, no, it's not the case that X, Y, Z. And that just reinforces in their head like, oh, yeah, I heard X, Y, Z somewhere. So it's actually working against you. And also it is a more direct way of saying that that person was was wrong when we don't need to harp on that. So instead you want to offer the correct information. So putting these two together, something like, yeah, actually that's a really common misconception. Lots of people think that. Actually, the way it works is ABC. And then third, uh, add on an extra point of interest to move the conversation forward. You can say something like, um, I find it really interesting that this often comes up because X, Y, Z, um, that really easy ones are where, um, people have absorbed something that's American that doesn't apply in the Canadian context, because you can always say, yeah, you know, a lot of Canadians actually get a lot of their legal information from, you know, American courtroom dramas, American TV shows from serial. And some of that applies here, but a lot of it actually doesn't. It's really complicated. And so you always have to make sure to be using Canadian sources for information. And that's how you're going to move the conversation forward. And that's how you can move it towards whatever the thing is that you have to take on next. Um, this little three-point structure will just help you get through without coming off like you're 
uh, like you're punishing the person for speaking up or volunteering information because it happened to be wrong. You also are inevitably going to hear anecdotes about things not working as they should. Uh, and this can be really tricky. Um, you may have a young person disclosing something that happened to them or in their family where a bunch of what happens just doesn't connect from you. And you have the sense that there's either context they're not sharing or there's something that they don't know or have misunderstood about their own circumstance. So think about this for a second. Law is incredibly complicated and hard to understand, um, and often it involves very private things. So if this anecdote is about someone else in their life, if it's about a parent or a family member or a friend, consider that that person may have not given them the whole context, and it's not their fault for not having that whole context. Um, you can sort of highlight some of that if appropriate, but we don't want to speculate about someone in their life essentially withholding key information or lying to them. The other thing is that even if there is a legal professional presence, um, a lawyer, they went through some sort of process, it's very common for people to walk away from those processes with an incomplete or patchwork understanding of what the heck just happened. Um, and this also is not their fault. Um, this is not on them. Uh, the legal system, it, despite often everyone's best effort, does a pretty bad job of explaining itself to people who are going through it. So in those cases, we again want to want to validate like, wow, that sounds that sounds really intense. That's something <laughs> something really happened to you guys. Um, try to offer how it should have worked. Like, for example, um, in my understanding, in that sort of situation, X, Y, Z should normally happen. Uh, it sounds like something was a little weird there. Essentially, we want to try to be as non-judgmental as possible about that and not insult people's interpretation of their own experiences while also trying to offer accurate information and not giving the sense that um, the, the strange thing that happened to them is what happens to everyone. It is good to be aware that there can be some emotions and conflicting opinions in the room. You probably already know whether the topic that you're going to talk about is sort of a hot button issue or not, um, but this can come up in any environment. So it's, it's just good to be mindful of, be prepared for it in your own head. Um, and again, try to keep the conversation moving, uh, but don't be afraid of it if it comes up. Um, we have some quick tips here for you. Uh, don't try to use slang you wouldn't normally use uh, just to try to be relatable to young people. That doesn't work. Um, and also don't make a joke out of it. Just just be sincere and, and be yourself and it'll be fine. Um, we do want to a little bit redirect people away from sharing overly personal legal issues, especially ones that aren't resolved yet. And especially, especially charges under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. There are lots of reasons for that. There are confidentiality issues. Um, remember, these young people are here in community with other people that they will see again the next day or the next week. You may go, but, you know, they're, they're airing their their laundry among among a community of people that they will stay in. So we want to help people with not over disclosing in this context. And a, a really good response to hearing about things not always working as they should is to say they don't always work the way we want it to, but most people involved with the legal system are trying really hard to be fair and to do well at their jobs. Next up, this is a huge one, remembering not to use jargon or legal terms of art. These are everywhere in the legal system and in the way we talk about law and even in the way we talk about our own jobs. So this is part of why we suggest practicing your explanations for certain things ahead of time, because it's going to help you uh, flag what those jargon things are. If you have someone close to you in your life, a spouse or family members um, who don't have anything to do with the legal system, you can try explaining your thing to them and getting them to be honest with you when you're using uh, phrases that don't make sense to them or the way you've approached something doesn't make sense to them. That can be incredibly helpful. Lots of people, uh, when they're presenting to marginalized youth, um, like to imagine that they're talking to a relative or friend who 
knows absolutely nothing about law, but is like a decently intelligent person who's capable of understanding, just hasn't been exposed to it before. And think about how you would explain things to that person. That's usually a pretty good barometer of, of where your tone should be. It's also okay and often necessary to use legal language. We just want you to pause and explain your terms. If you have a facilitator or a co-presenter there, one huge thing you can do to help each other is pausing the other person and asking questions if they use a phrase that you see the audience not understanding. Um, that can be as simple as, oh, I, I heard you use this term. Do you mind expanding on what that is? Or like, I'm seeing some confused faces. Does everyone know what we mean when we say X? If you are a lawyer, don't bother with legislative section numbers. Um, mostly those are just confusing. That's just like oral spam to people. Just get right to the content of what of what the law says. The only exception is if your audience is likely to hear the section number quoted to refer to a process or rule. So if this is in a particular area where lots of people would potentially say, oh, we'll do a Section 7 application and not expand on it, they may need to know what a Section 7 is. So in that case, we can say explicitly, here's the rule, here's what's going on. You might hear people refer to this as a Section 7. That's because it comes from Section 7 of this piece of legislation. But for the most part, as much as we think of, of law as coming from certain uh, pieces of legislation or certain judgments, um, this all applies to case names as well. That stuff just doesn't make sense to most people. And yeah, remember that there's also a risk of jargon in the way you introduce yourself and talk about your own work. Uh, it's very, very alienating to have someone come into a space and say, Hello, I'm the managing partner of the Intellectual Property Practice Group, where I specialize in trial and appellate level litigation. So most people don't know what managing partner means. They don't know what you would be if you weren't, a, you know, they don't know about associates and partners. They don't know what a practice group is. Like, what is that? They may not know um, exactly what your area of law is, like what intellectual property is in this example. Um try it or appellate level litigation like what does that really mean uh, lots of people don't really know all the range of things that lawyers do so think also about how to explain what you actually do and introducing yourself in a in a more understandable relatable way also be careful with little things like calling something just the board when it, you know you may know full well that you mean the immigration and refugee board or, you know, the social benefits tribunal, whatever, the landlord and tenant board, uh, you have to spell that out. Like, remember that it's very confusing to hear someone just refer to the board out of nowhere. All right. One of the last things to be prepared for is students who are multitasking. Um, this can be kind of shocking to, to presenters and facilitators who come into a space, but it's very common and it's actually something we want to lean into and work with. So, you may have students who are on their phones, who now and then are having side conversations, who are coming in and out of the room, or who are eating during the time that you're presenting and trying to work with them. So this is where we really want to have checked in with the host beforehand. Um, we want to know if phones are a normal thing for students to be on. There are lots and lots of environments where having something to fiddle with, like a phone or or like a neighbor, um, actually helps students focus. It helps keep them engaged for more than five minutes at a time. And it's just a necessary thing you're going to have to work with. Um, so adapt your tone and pace based on what's going on in the room. You know, remember, even if you do have sort of a captive audience, they're not prisoners. Uh, so you still have to be working to keep them. Um, if something is important, whether it's instructions or facts, say it three times at least. Reiterate it, repeat yourself, it's worth it. And if you do have a really chatty group that's also easily distracted, you can sort of wrangle that to your advantage by engaging the most social or outspoken students to steer conversations back on track. That said, make sure you're not leaving behind the quieter students who may also have things to say, just not be as quick with them. So we want to monitor whether students are understanding. Uh, and this can be a lot more complicated than it seems. The first step is just paying attention, of course, which we've which we've already covered. But you want to actually look at whole body language, not just are they nodding. You know, nodding can be a really helpful thing, but lots of students also nod just to keep you moving, even if they don't actually understand what you're going through. 
A good technique here is to ask questions and the, get them to explain things back to you. Uh, we've outlined some helpful phrases down at the bottom of this page. Uh, you could ask something like, so how would you explain that to somebody who wasn't in the room with us right now? Or, so if somebody asked you about this tomorrow, what would you tell them to do? Don't automatically assume that looking down or away means that students aren't listening, but you do have to check in. Now, this is something that varies a lot depending on your audience. You'll see this come up a lot sometimes with First Nations communities, with newcomer communities especially. Some, you know, eye contact and really assertive conversational styles read really differently to people from different cultural backgrounds and orientations. Uh, in some cases, uh, looking, you know, really directly at at people and and speaking freely is sort of a not respectful of authority, which you may be received as the authority in the room. So remember that there's huge variation. Also, simultaneously, for some people, like jumping in and speaking up and sort of arguing back and forth is a totally normal part of learning. Um, so this is where, again, we want to know what to expect when we're going into the room to know whether we're still in the range of, of what we, what's normal for this group um, and what makes sense and when we're just losing them. Uh, don't ask, do you have any questions? A far better thing to say is, what questions do you have? Um, there will be questions. It is very tempting if you don't understand what's going on when someone says, do you have any questions, to just say no, because you just want to get out of the situation without them realizing that you don't know what's going on. Asking what questions do you have is, is a lot more welcoming, and you'll see different results. Remember to look at faces. There's nothing wrong with backing up explaining your terms, and getting everybody back on board. You can interject with things like, I'm seeing some confused faces. Should I repeat that last part? Do you want me to go over that again? Or, I'm sorry, I should explain what X is. So that's something you could use when you have accidentally used a phrase that was uh, legalese and you just want to double back and clarify. All that stuff's perfectly normal and probably will happen at some point over the course of your of your presentation. It's important just to acknowledge it quickly and self-correct, because once you've lost people, they typically will just continue to get more lost the longer you go without correcting that misunderstanding. And one of the last things that can be one of the trickiest parts of, of public legal education is overcoming hidden barriers to people using the information they've been given. In some cases, you know, they're hidden barriers. You may not know all of them, but with careful preparation, you can probably uh, conduct your session to overcome some of them. So one example that's come up for us recently is that many newcomers, depending on their country of origin, are really wary and distrustful of governments and official services that may be related to things they experienced in their country of origin or just how they were culturally raised. They may even avoid helpful services out of fear or uncertainty. So that means that in those cases, you know, giving them the phone number for a community legal clinic is and saying, oh, they can help you if you have a landlord and tenant issue is probably not enough. Um, those students are still probably going to choose to try to do just about anything rather than interact with the formal system. We still want to talk about those services, especially local ones, but we also want to counteract that by actually demonstrating that it's safe and easy to contact them. So if you're going to, in that case, if you're going to introduce a local legal clinic, uh, tell the clinic ahead of time that you're going to be calling, uh, explain what the program is that you're doing. When you bring up the legal clinic, have students put the number into their phone. You do the same. And then you can actually demonstrate from your phone calling the clinic on speakerphone. So you can call, the front desk will pick up, you'll say, hi, it's me, I'm calling from this program. Students will get to hear who answers, they'll get to see how it all works, they'll get to hear that that person is friendly and helpful, that person can explain the clinic's services, you can even ask them to take you through, you know, what questions would you ask to someone who just called in um, so they can hear, oh, I just have to say, you know, my postal code and sort of what kind of issue is it and then they'll tell me when to come in and all that stuff. These kinds of things lower the fear barrier by a huge amount. It can feel like a silly use of time in the moment, 
Um, but it's really not because it amplifies the chance that down the road, that young person who needs help will actually reach out and get it. So last of all, the big picture. Students having a positive experience with you is more important than getting every piece of information across. Remember that, you know, in lots of cases, uh, you may be the first legal professional that these young people have met, or you may be the first one they've had the chance to talk to when they're not in a moment of legal crisis. And the impression that you make means something for how they'll think of the legal profession going forward. Uh, and, you know, whether they'll choose to reach out for help, whether they'll um, just try to put off dealing with legal problems and make them all worse. We want to remember to give resources at every possible opportunity. Last of all, we want to be generous. We want to, you know, assume the best of people, uh, give them the most of our effort um, and the, the kindest interpretation to everything they're doing and have fun. Thank you so much for supporting Justice Education in your community, for being willing to work with us. We hope you have a really great time and program. Your work makes a huge difference, uh, and we're endlessly thankful to you for agreeing to do it. If you have any questions, either about this presentation or about the program you're going to be involved in, feel free to reach out to us, either to the program person that you've been in contact with or using the contact information below.